Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a wrap-up of the Penguin Little Black Classics box set. So, I've finally finished reading all of these beauties. Okay, so the way we're going to do this, I'm going to talk you through my five least favourite, and then we have the 55 just remaining ones that I'm just going to go through and just list off the titles, and then I will talk to you about my 20 favourite. So, let's start with the five least favourite, and those are... Okay, coming in at number five, we have Wilfred Owen, Anthem for Doomed Youth. Penguin Little Black Classic number 50, uh, the blurb here. The great First World War poet portrays firsthand the horror, devastation and futility of the trenches. And just my problem here was that I know that Wilfred Owen's super well respected and I was expecting really for him to kind of blow my mind and it was just a little bit of a letdown. It wasn't terrible, but it was only like maybe a three out of five for me and I was just, you know, I, I just, I tend to like stuff about the war as well. So I just, I don't know. I don't know what it was about it. It just, it didn't hit the mark for me. Then we have at number four, these are my fourth least favourite, Johan Peter Habel. How a ghastly story was brought to light by a common or garden butcher's dog, number 22. Sparkling miniature German fables, sketches and tall tales, including Kafka's favourite story. And this one, I just picked this one to go in here because it represents the unmemorable ones, you know? There were quite a few like this where I read them and they just didn't stick with me after I read them. At number three, we have Thomas Nash, The Terrors of the Night, number 30. Demonic horrors and spirits dreamt up by the most exuberant, inventive prose writer of Elizabethan England. And now my problem here was just that considering this is, like, you know, it's spirits and horrors and demons and all this stuff, I was expecting to it, it to at least be exciting or interesting, and it was neither of those things. It was just basically his sort of ramblings about all of these weird beliefs that he had and, you know... It just didn't didn't really work because I didn't share those beliefs. At number two, we have Herman Melville, The Maldive Shark, number 38. Dark, nightmarish sea stories and poems inspired by Melville's adventures around the world's oceans in a whaler. And it was just dull. And this makes me worry a lot about Moby Dick, which I do have and haven't read. But considering it's a similar subject matter as well, and I thought this was dull, I'm just not looking forward to... 650 pages, you know? And then my least favourite is uh, Jane Austen, The Beautiful Cassandra, number 33. Austen's riotous early stories of drunks, prisoners and prison breaks written for her family's entertainment when she was a teenager. And the issue here is that they were written for her family's entertainment. They were never designed really for public cons consumption. I mean, she was a teenager. No teenagers really write particularly well. I, I didn't write very well as a teenager, you know? And I just think of all the things they could have selected of hers, they just chose the worst possible sample. And like, even it's like riddled with misspellings. So like, beautiful here is deliberately spelled how she spelled it with two L's. But then there was like, friend was F R E I N D, and stuff like that. And it's just like, it's just a spelling mistake. I don't know why they didn't edit those out. Anyway, now we're going to run through in order of the 55 that were neither good nor bad. So we have so we have number one, Giovanni Boccaccio, Mrs. Rosie and the Priest. Number two, Gerard Manny Hopkins as Kingfishers Catch Fire. Number three, The Saga of Gunlaug Serpent Tongue, which is by Anonymous. <laughs> number four, On Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts by Thomas De Quincey. Number six, John Ruskin, Traffic. Number seven, Poo Songling, Wailing Ghosts. Number ten, Walt Whitman, On the Beach at Night Alone. Number eleven, Kenko, A Cup of Sake Beneath the Cherry Trees. Number twelve, Balthazar Gracian, How to Use Your Enemies. Number thirteen, John Keats, The Eve of St. Agnes. Number fourteen, Thomas Hardy, A Woman Much Missed. Number fifteen, Guy de Maupassant, Femme Fatale. Number sixteen, Travels in the Land of Serpents and Pearls by Marco Polo. Number 17, Caligula by Suetonius. Number 18, Jason and Medea by Apollonius of Rhodes. Number 19, Olala by Robert Louis Stevenson. Always reminds me of that Rihanna song. What's my name? Number 21, Petronius Trimalchio's Feast. Number 26, Henry Mayhew of Street Pie Men. Number 27, Hafez, The Nightingales Are Drunk. Number 29, Michel de Montaigne, How We Weep and Laugh at the Same Thing. Number 31, Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart. Number 32, Mary Kingsley, A Hippo Banquet. Number 34, Anton Chekhov, Gooseberries. Number 35, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Well They Are Gone and Here Must I Remain. Number 36, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Sketchy, Doubtful, Incomplete Jottings. Number 39, Elizabeth Gaskell, The Old Nurse's Story. Number 40, Nikolai Leskov, The Steel Flea. 
Number 41, Honoré de Balzac, The Atheist's Mass. Number 43, Remember Body by C.P. Cavafri. Number 44, The Meek One by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Number 45, A Simple Heart by Gustave Flaubert. Number 46, The Nose by Nikolai Gogol. Number 48, The Reckoning by Edith Wharton. Number 49, The Figure in the Carpet by Henry James. Number 51, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, My Dearest Father. Number 53, Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti. Number 55, Antigone by Sophocles. Number 56, Ryanosuke Ekatagawa, The Life of a Stupid Man. Number 58, Giorgio Vasari, Leonardo da Vinci. Number 60, Shen Fu, The Old Man and the Moon. Number 63, Emily Bronte, The Night is Darkening Round Me. Number 64, Joseph Conrad, Tomorrow. Number 65, The Voyage of Sir Francis Drake Around the Whole Globe by Richard Hakloyt. Number 66, A Pair of Silk Stockings by Kate Chopin. Number 67, It Was Snowing Butterflies by Charles Darwin. Number 70, Circe and the Cyclops by Homer. Number 71, Il Juro by D.H. Lawrence. Number 72, Miss Brill by Catherine Mansfield. Number 73, The Fall of Icarus by Ovid. Number 74, Come Close by Sappho. Number 75, Kazyan from the Beautiful Lands by Ivan Turgenev. Number 76, O Cruel Alexis by Virgil. Number 77, A Slip Under the Microscope by H.G. Wells. Number 78, The Madness of Cambyses by Herodotus. And number 79, Speaking of Siva by Anonymous. Okay, so that brings me on to my 20 best. So in at number 20, we have Dante Circles of Hell. Number 25, A Terrifying Depiction of Sin and Eternal Damnation from Dante's Inferno, the medieval epic that revolutionized the Italian language. Now I've actually, I've read this before now. So this is an excerpt from Inferno, and then I read Inferno by itself, and then I read The Divine Comedy as well. So I've read all three of them, and you know, some of these, some of the ones I just mentioned in the previous list as well, were like rereads or things I'd come across before, like Edgar Allan Poe, for example. But I thought Dante, out of all of them, deserved to be in the top 20. Just. Okay, in at number 19, we have number 42, The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This horrifying semi-autobiographical feminist story of imprisonment and madness scandalised 19th century society. And it also has two other stories, The Rocking Chair and Old Water. And all three of them were just fantastic, like just really well written, if nothing else. Um, but, you know, I, I just thought they gave you sort of plenty of food for thought as well. So, um, yeah, definitely. And actually, most of these people here as well, they're either authors that I already liked or they're new to me and that I want to read more of them, you know. OK, at number 18, we have Jonathan Swift, A Modest Proposal. This is number eight. Swift's ferocious landmark 18th century political satire on how to solve a famine in Ireland. And basically, the way to solve the famine is to eat people. I believe possibly even children, maybe babies. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it was, it's, it's funny because it would have obviously been super relevant at the time when there was actually the potato famine on, so I can imagine it was quite hard hitting and also quite controversial at the time, but um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was interesting, definitely worth reading. And number 17, we have Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, The Communist Manifesto, number 20. This revolutionary summons to work has transformed the modern world and still shapes millions of lives today. And I'm not going to say I agreed with all of it, in fact, probably far from it, but there were certainly a lot of things, again, that made me think. And I think it's just one of those things that, again, it's, as it said, it sort of shaped the world. And so um, I think everyone should read it before they die kind of thing, you know? Okay, number 17, we have Oscar Wilde, Lord Arthur Savile's Crime, number 59. Wilde's supremely witty tale of dandies, anarchists, and a murderous prophecy in London high society. And again, this is another reread for me, and uh, yeah just it's Oscar Wilde you can't beat him I mean you can because there are more in this list but obviously these were new to me or mostly new to me so okay at number 15 we have The Wife of Bath by Geoffrey Chaucer number 28 one of the most famous Canterbury tales casts a satirical eye over sex and marriage in the middle age and it also has uh, The Wife of Bath uh, prologue in this as well and it was just excellent uh, so this is one of the reasons I've now added the the full Canterbury tales to my, uh, you know, my wish list that I want to read eventually, and yeah, it was quite bawdy at times as well. Like again, I could imagine. Well, I, I suppose it was a different time, but like in the in the in like the Victorian era, for example, it would have been considered quite. 
quite controversial to read it, I would have thought. Okay, number 14, we have Sinbad the Sailor by Anonymous, number 54. Adventures of Shipwreck, Colossal Beasts, and Fantastical Islands from 1001 Nights. And I've never read any of this, you know, the Sinbad lore before. Um, obviously, I am familiar with it through popular culture and stuff, so it was just fascinating to go back to the, the source material and see what it's all about, you know? Okay, in at number 13, we have three Tang Dynasty poets. It's listed by Anon, but the poets are actually Wang Wei, Li Po, and Tu Fu. And this is number nine, pastoral lyrical verse evoking the rural landscapes and peoples of 8th century China from three of its finest poets. And to be honest, I think with poetry, the best way to tell whether you're gonna like it is to listen to some of it. So this is The Visitor. North and south of our huts spread the spring waters and only flocks of gulls daily visit us. For guests, our path is yet unswept of petals. To you, our wattle gate, the first time opens. Dishes so far from town lack subtle flavors and wine is but the rough a poor home offers. If you agree, I'll call my ancient neighbour across the fence to come help us finish it. So yeah, I enjoyed these. Would recommend. At number 12, we have Friedrich Nietzsche, Aphorisms on Love and Hate. Number 5, the iconoclastic German philosophers blazing maxims on revenge, false pity and the drawbacks of marriage. And I've always been told by people that I'd enjoy Nietzsche. And uh, yeah, he lived up to the hype for me. I now want to read more. I think this is an excerpt from, uh, yeah, from Human, All Too Human. But I'd, yeah, I'll probably keep my eyes peeled and try and get some second hand if I can. In at number 11 we have Catalyst, I Hate and I Love, number 69. By turns rapturous, erotic and despairing, this astonishingly modern verse tells of an ancient Roman poet's all-consuming infatuation with one woman. So again, I'll read you some of this. Uh, let's go for this one. Now spring bursts with warm airs, now the furor of March skies retreats under Zephyrus, and Catullus will forsake these Phrygian fields, the sun-drenched farmlands of Nicaea, and make for the resorts of Asia Minor, the famous cities. Now the trepidation of departure, now lust of travel, feet impatiently urging him to be gone. Good friends, goodbye, we met in this distant place, far from our Italy, who by divergent paths must find our separate ways home. So yeah, I do think it does have something quite modern in feel to it, especially when it gets to his sort of, you know, him writing about sex and whatnot. Here we have number 10, Aesop, The Dolphins, The Whales and The Gudgeon. This is Penguin Little Black Classic number 61. Composed by a slave in Greek antiquity, some of the most ancient, sharp-witted and mysterious stories ever told. And I like how they have like the meanings of them as well. So let's, I'll read this one out to you. The snake, the house ferret and the mice. A snake and a house ferret were fighting each other in a certain house where they lived. The mice of the house, who were forever being eaten by one or the other of them, came quietly out of their holes when they heard them fighting. At the sight of the mice, the two combatants gave up their battle and turned on the mice. And the moral is, it is the same in the city-states. People who interfere in the quarrels of the demagogues become, without suspecting it, the victims of both sides. So there we go. Number nine, Hans Christian Andersen, The Tinderbox, number 23. Andersen's bittersweet fairy tales propelled their troubled author to international fame and revolutionised children's writing. And I'd never actually read any Hans Christian Andersen before. I think I actually have read The Tinderbox, thinking about it. But like, no, I've never read a collection of his stuff. I've only read like random stories and anthologies and stuff like that, or for, you know, schoolwork and things. But yeah, it was a real treat, and I want to, I've added his uh, complete short stories to my wish list. You might sense a theme here. I also didn't know how to rank these three because they're all roughly similar. But uh, number eight on my list is The Rubber, Gri the Rubber Bridegroom, number 68 by Brothers Grimm. Drawn from German folklore, dark, fantastical fairy tales of wicked deeds, gruesome punishment, and just rewards. And I love as well how, like, brutal these are. Alright, so, uh, my battery on my camera filled up. But we, we were talking about the, the, the Brothers Grimm, so I do want to read a full collection of their stuff at some point. I also visited Grimmstrasse, Grimm Street, that was named after them in Berlin, which was quite cool. Uh, yeah, just probably my favourite, well... Of all the fairy tales in the box set, this one was my favourite. Okay, in at number 7 we have Samuel Pepys, The Great Fire of London, number 47. Originally written in code, Pepys' diary includes his unforgettable eyewitness account of the 1666 fire. It also actually has his, uh, his account of the plague in uh, 1665 as well, which I thought was quite interesting. This is another one where I want to read the full thing, so I want to read the unabridged diaries of Samuel Pepys. He was uh, a naval officer as well, and just some interesting stuff here, like how he buried his wine and his cheese to avoid the great fire. You've got people like taking their belongings out of their houses to their you know friends and relatives' houses, 
and then having to move them again a day later as the fire unfolds. And also it's just fascinating that it's like a blow-by-blow -blow eyewitness account of this iconic event that happened hundreds of years ago, you know? At number six we have Leo Tolstoy, How Much Land Does a Man Need? This is number 57. A parable of a Russian peasant's bargain with the devil, considered by James Joyce a parable of a Russian peasant's bargain with the devil, considered by James Joyce to be the world's greatest love story. This also includes what men live by as well, and to be honest, the reason that this is so high up is just that I thought it was so well written, and so I have also added War and Peace, or was it Crime and Punishment? Whichever one that Tolstoy wrote, and not the one that Dostoevsky wrote, although I might get to the other one at some point. I do know this, it's just, I keep getting them confused, and now it's got to the point where I unironically get them confused. And number five, we have the Dhammapada by Anon. Uh, number 80, ancient aphorisms on endurance, self-control, and perfect joy, widely acknowledged as the Buddha's own teachings. And this is just really beautifully written and beautifully translated by Awan Mascaro. Uh, this is from uh, the edition first published in 1973. And I just think there are lots of little lines in this that kind of apply to day-to-day -day life. It's it's similar to like the art of war, except it's like the pacifist art of war, I think, you know? Let's, let's read some on wakefulness. If by forsaking a small pleasure one finds a great joy, he who is wise will look to the greater and leave what is less. He who seeks happiness for himself by making others unhappy is bound in the chains of hate and from those he cannot be free. By not doing what should be done, and by doing what should not be done, the sinful desires of proud and thoughtless men increase. In at number four, we have Rudyard Kipling, The Gate of the Hundred Sorrows, number 24. Opium dens, curses, ghostly tombs. These sinister tales of Imperial India made Kipling's name as a writer. And there's some messed up shit in this one. There's one where the, uh, they basically shame an Indian native so much that this guy kills himself, and then they hide the fact that he killed himself from his family because they think it would cause further dishonor and so this I don't know it's just a different time you know I, I don't know how well the representation is here or anything but um I didn't notice anything particularly you know unbearably racist about it basically so there's that as well and um, just it was just really well written and very different to the Jungle Book but actually I found I really liked it okay at number three we have Socrates defense by Plato number 52 Sentenced to death for corrupting the youth of ancient Athens, Socrates, Plato's teacher, founded Western philosophy. So this was just beautiful, and I think it's important to remember as well that this is Plato. Writing about this, this emotional subject, he's just seen his mentor be sentenced to death, you know? And, uh, and here we have, uh, so the sentence of death is approved. Socrates addresses the court for the final time, and I just think this bit's brilliant. You'll not have bought a lot of time at this price, men of Athens, getting the name from anyone who wants to abuse the city for being the ones who killed off Socrates, a wise man. People who want to find fault with Athens will of course say that I'm wise even if I'm not. At any rate, if you'd waited a little time, you'd have had the same outcome without doing anything. You can see my age for yourselves, how far on I am in life, how near to death. I say this not to all of you, just to those of you who voted to put me to death. And I've got something else to say to these people. You probably imagine, Athenians, that I stand condemned because I lack the sorts of arguments with which I could have persuaded you, given always that I supposed I should do and say everything to escape the penalty. Far from it. If I've been condemned for the lack of something, it's not a lack of arguments, but a lack of effrontery and shamelessness, and the willingness to address you in the sorts of ways that it had pleased you most to hear, wailing and lamenting and doing and saying plenty of other things unworthy of me, as I claim, even if they're the sort of things you're used to hearing from everyone else. I didn't think that I should do anything unworthy of a free man, despite the danger I face, nor do I now regret having made my defence as I did." So yeah, really awesome. I also now want to read uh, Plato's Republic as well, so yeah, that was a good one. In at number two we have Matsuo Basho, Lips Too Chilled, number 62. Japan's celebrated Buddhist poet balances the smallness of humanity with nature's epic drama in these magical 17th century haikus. Now I studied Basho at university, so I kind of already knew what to expect going into it. And uh, my only criticism of this is that because it's haiku and they could have got many, like so many more of his haiku in this collection instead of having two per page. But um, I'm going to read you some of his work because it's just beautiful. In my new robe this morning, someone else. Fields, mountains of Hubabu. Oh, fields, mountains of Hubaku in nine days, spring. Year by year, the monkey's mask reveals the monkey. New Year, the Basho Tosai Hermitage, a buzz with haiku. 
Now, I don't, I don't actually need to read more Basho because I've read The Narrow Road to the Deep North, but I will if I come across some. This was actually from uh, On Love and Barley, Haiku of Basho. So, um, yeah, there's at least one other kind of collection there that I could read. But, yeah, overall, really enjoyed it. And in at number one, we have Charles Dickens' The Great Winglebury Jewel, number 37. Two rollicking tales of scoundrels and ne'er-do-wells from the sketches by Boz that launched Dickens' career. And it turns out that I really like early Dickens, and now I want to read all of the sketches by Boz. I mean, it's also quite cool that there are some illustrations as well. But these were just generally, like, genuinely hilarious and a lot of fun to boot as well. Um, it's got me in the mood for more Dickens, and even though I've read some, like I've read Oliver Twist, I definitely want to read more of Dickens because of this. And uh, yeah, a worthy winner, I think. All in all then, I thought it was a pretty good box set. There was some I liked more than others, but I think just to get me like, give me quite a wide range of classical writers, I thought it was pretty good. There were also some that I've read before. I'm getting super anxious at the moment because I'm kind of having chest pains, which isn't good. But um, I don't know why that is, but I figure if I keep on filming, then maybe the anxiety will go away and I will stop having heart palpitations. But um, what was I saying? Yeah. Some of them were better quality than others. Also, it annoyed me that like some of them, they have like different different capitalization on the covers. So, for example, look, lips too chilled has got one capital on the L, and then the two and the chilled are a lower case. And then here we have the gate of the hundred sorrows, and that's capitalized correctly. So I don't know why that's a thing, but that kind of annoyed me. But all in all, yeah, glad I read these. Um, yeah. So anyway, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this video and, uh, you know, if you've read any of these little black classics, I would be interested to know. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.